were out somewhere, I can't remember if it was a Dairy Queen or the library or um, somewhere like that. And uh, it was a few weeks ago before all the rain started. And it was, a, it was an afternoon, it was a beautiful day, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. And uh, we pulled up into the driveway and uh, I put my little hand up above by the uh, top of the whatever it is and hit the button for the garage door to open and nothing happened. So I thought, well, maybe I missed the button because there's two buttons up there and I hit the wrong one because I was, you know, full of ice cream or something. And so anyway, I hit the button again and nothing happened. And I thought, oh, brother, you know, if you own a home and you know uh, uh, if some, nothing's wrong with it, just wait, you know, because something's going to happen. <laughs> so I was thinking, here goes the, uh, you know, the, the guard show open is out. You know, it's another 250 bucks. It's going to be another 250 bucks for somebody to come and put a new one in or fix it, whatever it is. And so I was bracing myself. So I thought, well, maybe, maybe the connection between the car and the, the opener, somehow there was... It wasn't rain, but there was some atmosphere or something. Maybe it was the dust from the Sierra or something. <laughs> so anyway, I went over and I have this little flip thing, and you hit these numbers and you hit the, and the light went on, which was a good sign, but, but there was a battery in there. And I pushed it real hard and nothing happened. So I uh, got out of the car and, and parked it and uh, went over to the bushes and I have a key hidden in our bushes because the only way to get into the house without a key, and I'm not going to tell you where, but it's in the bushes. <laughs> the only thing you worry about, you don't know what's in the bushes with that key. <laughs> so you go through carefully, make some noise. Well, I got the key out, opened the garage door, went in, turned on the light, and there was no light. Wow. So, do you know what happened? I lost my source of power. Easy. The power was out. When the power is out, everything, everything is bad. You miss it. You know, when you're afraid to open the refrigerator and, and, and get a drink because then everything is going to get spoiled. And you want to open the freezer and get some the ice cream because everything's going to. No. Yeah, it is really quick. And, uh, <laughs> and then you're afraid. You're, it, this is Florida and it's going to be hot because the air conditioning is not working. So then you think, oh man, did the, some fuse, some of my boxes all screwed up? This is going to cost me a lot more money than I thought. And you start worrying about all of this. And then so I got on my cell phone and called the neighbor. He didn't have power. Another neighbor didn't have power. And what is it? It's a beautiful day. There's no traffic. There's not a cloud in the sky. Why does the power go off on a day like that? But you realize how much you miss your source of power. I couldn't go out on the computer and play solitaire. I couldn't do anything. <laughs> I'm going to talk this morning about how important it is to be connected. There's a new covenant church starting over in Melbourne, and it's a bad time to start a covenant church because you're just trying to get people together and things like this. And one of the main messages is staying connected. We're trying to stay connected with the new people we have, stay connected with God who's working on this church, and, and trying to get it going. But I'm going to talk about two illustrations in the Old Testament about being connected and what happens when we're not connected with God. And then we're going to go on into the parable. The first one uh, has to do with Moses and Joshua. You know, the most famous revered person in the Old Testament was not David, and not Solomon, not Elijah, uh, not Ezekiel. But it's Moses. Moses, at 80 years old, got reconnected with God at a burning bush. God revealed to him as he, as he had left Egypt, was out there living, raising a family, working in Midian, uh, working for his father-in-law. And God said, I want you to take, to be the leader of get my people, the Israelites, who were thousands at this time, out of slavery in Egypt and bring them to this promised land that I promised your ancestor Abraham a long time ago. Now, being 400 years in Egypt, obviously the culture there affected the Israelites, and they were worshiping gods there, the Egyptian gods, other things. They, were, they weren't close to, to God as we know it at all. So Moses had a job here, not only to bring these people out of the most powerful country, 
powerful army, biggest army in the world at the time, to bring them out of there and then teach them about God, train them, and get them into the promised land. I mean, who would want to do that? <laughs> but Moses was connected with God, even though he cut the connection a few times, uh, he got frustrated and things like this. But God did these ten amazing plagues in Egypt and finally convinced Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. He finally convinced the Israelites that God was the God of their fathers and he had something for them to fulfill their promise. They get out in the wilderness and all kinds of things happen, but God opens up the Red Sea. And they still talk about this, even in the New Testament today. This great miracle where all the Israelites got across, and as Pharaoh had changed his mind, and the Israel, uh, Egyptians came with their chariots, and you've seen the movie, they got um, completely washed away and destroyed. Then, to feed these people in the, in the desert for all these years, God dropped manna, bread, six days a week. He dropped birds so they could just grab the birds out of eyes, sort of like a Chick-fil-A thing real quickly. <laughs> but they had birds and manna the whole time. And then when they were thirsty, Moses hit a couple rocks. And then they had water to drink. And they got there. So after 40 years of some problems, you know, and some rebellion and some anxious people, and even Moses was uh, kind of punished by God saying, there it is, the promised land, but you're not going. But your guy Joshua is going to bring them across. Okay, so now the Israelites are together on the other side of the Jordan River. It's flood time. And uh, God says, I'm going to make a covenant with you that I want you to be my people. And I promise to be your people and to protect you and to give you this land. I promise to give you victory and give you victory over the, the Canaanites and the Jebusites and the Philistines and the Mennonites and the Mosquito Bites and all these people <laughs> out there. I'm going to give you victory. So... The priests go in the river up to their ankles holding the tabernacle, the, the Ten Commandments, and uh, um, the waters open up, they get across, they're on the other side, they're camped, and the first obstacle that they have to face is the city of Jericho. This is 600 feet below sea level. It's one of the oldest cities in the ancient world. It's called the City of Palms, and it, has, it was fortified. It had these huge walls around it. And, and uh, there was no way that normal armies could actually take this or conquer this. But God said, I'm going to give you this city. But as I do it, all the gold, all the silver, all the good stuff in there normally goes to the soldiers, you know, to split up and things. On this one, it all goes to God. Everybody said yes. Well, talking about Jericho, which we've been at a few times, uh, reminds me of a story. There was this church that was looking for this pastor. And uh, so they were candidating this particular pastor on this Sunday, thinking that he, would, he, he was a good prospect. And so it was a Sunday, and the pastor was there, and uh, all the church people were there, and they were excited to meet this person and things like this. So it was during Sunday school hour, and the, this candidate pastor was walking through the education building, looking at the different Sunday school classes through the windows and stuff. And finally he said, to the guest with him, is it okay if I stop in one of the classes and, and just see it? And so they went into the junior high boys class and, and uh, saw the kids all sitting there and the teacher teaching. And then the man said, well, do you mind if I can ask these kids a question? And the teacher said, well, sure, that'd be okay. So the pastor said, well, who tore down the wall of Jericho? And it was real quiet. All of a sudden, little Johnny stood up and said, I didn't do it. <laughs> well, the Sunday school teacher was really embarrassed, you know, really embarrassed. And so uh, she went out in the hall with the pastor elect guy and a couple of leaders of the church. And uh, she shut the door of the Sunday school room and she said to him, I'm really embarrassed. I know little Johnny's parents. And if he said he didn't do it, he didn't do it. <laughs> well, Service went on, the morning service, and the pastor could see that there was a few people meeting in this back room, the leaders of the church and stuff like this, and he preached this wild sermon, and they all decided that they really liked this guy, and they were going to call him to be their pastor, and uh, 
So they met with him afterwards and they said, Pastor, we really like you. We really want you to become part of our church if you want. And he said, we don't want you to worry about a thing. And we took a vote, decided whatever that wall cost, we're willing to put up the money. <laughs> well, anyway, let's go back to the uh, city of Jericho. And uh, what happened for six days, the Israelites walked around the city just one time. And I'm sure the people in Jericho were looking out and looking down at them and saying, oh, wow, I'm not too scared of these people. And on the seventh day, they walked around seven times, blew these trumpets, and the walls came tumbling down. The only people saved were Rahab, who was a spy that they had checked out ahead of time, and her family, but everybody and all the plunder. All the Israelites were excited. Wow, this is how it's going to go. We're going to get these cities. We're going to get this promised land. We're going to be able to take this over. It's going to be pretty easy. The next city was just a small little city called Ai, A-I. And it was just up the road a little ways. And so uh, Jericho was so easy, they sent up um, just a couple thousand Israeli soldiers up there to take the city. And they went up to take it. And all of a sudden, the men from Ai came out and chased them away and killed 36 of the Israelites and, and all the other soldiers. They ran all the, all the way back to the camp. And Joshua and the people couldn't believe it. And they started shaking in their togas. I mean, they really got scared. What happened now? We got this one big city, but all of a sudden, has God left us? And they lost the connection with God. And it took them a little while to figure this out. But there was one person and all the Israelites that broke the connection and unfortunately it affected the whole group. And his name was Achan. And somehow the Lord led them to him and to his family and Joshua to him. And Achan had taken, taken a bar of gold, a whole bag of silver, and this beautiful robe the Brooks Brothers, just gorgeous with all kinds of stuff on it. And he thought, this was really nice. And he buried it in the bottom of his tent, thinking nobody would know. The connection was broken because the Israelites were told none of this stuff was yours. They lost their source of strength and power. The whole group did because of this. Because at this point, they were working together as a group. Well, Achan, uh, unfortunately, got stoned. The stuff went back into the pool, you know, for the temple later on. And uh, they moved on and were able to conquer the land. The second illustration of um, the Old Testament about losing our connection is the story of Gideon. And I'm not going to tell you the whole story because there are several chapters in the book of Judges about it. Gideon did not start the Gideons that we have today. And you find the Bibles in the hotels. But they just used his name doesn't get any royalties, but they just used his name. And uh, it's a good organization. But what happened was, as the Israelites moved in and conquered most of the land, they didn't do all of it. You know, and some Israelite guy falls in love with this Canaanite girl, and they get married, and, and then, you know, she brings her God's Baal into the family, and then they set up an Asherah pole, you know, start worshiping, and these Canaanites, Canaanites were so bad that they would sacrifice the firstborn son in their families. And, and um, the men all went to church because they had temple prostitutes, you know, that going on there. It was, it was bad for the whole community. There was terrible sin, and that's why God allowed them uh, to be punished in such a way as to be destroyed, and he was going to do it through the Israelites. Well, anyway, what happened was, and we read through the book of Judges, it says, and the people... Um, sinned against their God. And as they sinned and turned away from God, they broke their connection. Their connection got really weak. And then what would happen is some of these, one of these other nations would come and overpower them for a while, and then they would call out again. In this particular case, uh, where Gideon lived down in the area of Judah, it was the Mennonites. Um, for seven years, the Mennonites overpowered these people. Uh, where Gideon lived. And what they did was they waited till harvest time and the grapes were just ripe and, the, and they were all picked and the, the wheat was threshed and it was all set in baskets. And then they'd come in and raid them and steal all their stuff. And the Israelites had to go live in caves and starve for a year. 
And this went on for seven years until finally they called out to God and said, God, save us. We want to reconnect. We know you're the source of our power. And, uh, and God used a man named Gideon to reconnect him. And Gideon was part of a big family, and it's interesting, he had a big family too. He had several wives, 70 sons, and I don't know how many daughters. But anyway, he got together an army. He got neighboring Israelites from other places and said, God is going to give us you know, the victory. And he had some doubts. Remember the fleece and the wet and the cold and all this kind of stuff that he had put out. But he tore down the pagan gods, which everybody in the community got kind of irritated with him. But he said, listen, we got to reconnect. God wants to save us and deliver us from the Mennonites. So what happens is uh, he gets this big army together and they head to the battle with the thousands of Mennonites who are getting ready for battle. But then God said to Gideon, you know, God, I don't want you guys to get credit for this victory. We're going to pare you down. And he pared him down to 300 people. 300 people against thousands. And God was able to give the victory, the reconnection. For 40 years, Gideon led the people. And there was peace and there was connection until the next time they sinned again. We need to keep our connection with God. He's our source. He's our creator. He's the source of our spiritual power, our physical power, our emotional power. To be connected with him is so important. But we ask ourselves, why do we get disconnected? And that we go back to the parable here in the, in the book of Mark. And let me read it again just quickly. And listen to this. Behold, a sower went out to sow. It came about as he was sowing, some seed fell on the side of the road. And the birds came and ate it up. And other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil. And immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. And after the sun had risen, it was scorched. And because it had no root, it withered away. And the other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. And the other seeds fell into good soil, and it grew up and increased and yielded a crop and produced 30, 60, and 100 fold. This gives us an answer of why people get disconnected with God. The world, in a sense, is sort of that field. And God's word, God's love, is sown into this world in the field. When we lived in North Carolina, we attended this Methodist church that wasn't that friendly. <laughs> but I'll never forget this one sermon the assistant pastor gave when we were there. And she used this particular parable. And uh, in that parable, she t had a video of one of the farmers who was in the area. And he had this old tractor and he had his overhauls. And they did a little video of him planting his fields. And you see the tractor going along the dirt road and you see some of the seed falling out of the, of the back of the bag there on the ground. And then as he uh, troubles along into the field, there's some rocks, you know, and so some of the seeds falls in the rocks. And then he goes a little further and there's the edge of the field where the thorns and the weeds come and things like this. And then um, uh, you can see that. And then you see them, him go out and actually feed uh, and sow the seed in the whole area. And it was so, I mean, it was so basic, but it was so interesting to see it. And the first reason why we stay unconnected is because as the word of God is sown in this world, and it hits the ground, especially the path, it says um, it lands, in, in the interpretation it lands, but soon Satan is there to take the word of God. He wants to break the connection. We have an enemy in this world that's directly opposed to everything that God does. He lied to Adam and Eve. He lies to all of the people through the years. He's called the father of lies. And um, he can actually quote scripture like he did to Jesus in the, in the temptations uh, um, in the wilderness. Satan is, is powerful. And he actually the first three plagues of Egypt were reproduced by Satan with the Egyptian sorcerers. There's power there, but not ultimate power. 
God has the power, but Satan has power, and he can fool us. And so he can take the word of God and just snatch it away, saying to somebody, oh, this is not really important, this is not good, you don't need to think about this. God is just, they just want your money at church and things like this. So um, it never really even gets planted. The word is out there, you can flip any channel like I did this morning on TV looking for the news or the weather, and there's, I don't know how many preachers out there, and some of them good, some bad, but the word is out there. It's out there if you go in the Gideon Bible in the hotel, in the drawer, you can find it. And if it's a Marriott, there's a Mormon book next to it, but just <laughs> cover that up. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's what happens. Satan is there to steal and to keep us unconnected with our source of power. And so that's why you see so much struggling in the world. So many lies, so many things. Well, the second seed falls on the, uh, the rocks, the rocky soil. And our, our, we have a driveway of pavers at home. I gave up on a cement driveway because it got so cracked up. And several years ago, we put pavers. And pavers um, are over dirt and things like this. And so with all the rain and all the water coming down lately, all of a sudden these little seeds, I don't know how they do it, start growing up between the, the little pavers. And if you've gone uh, along the road too, you see the, uh, the, the cement things where the freeways are. At the, you see little seeds growing out, you know, there. They take hold because there's just a little dirt in there and there's just enough. And they get going and they just, they start up and they look like something could happen, something could grow and they do grow a little ways. And then you get the Florida sun <laughs> or you get the, the heat and they just can't handle it and they can only live so long before they, they fold out. Well that's again, as some people get to the word of God, get to it, but then some persecution, some questioning comes along. And they just fold under it. Uh, I'll never forget in my first church in Sacramento, there was a guy that, that accepted Christ when, when in my office one day. And uh, they had just been coming a few times, and he had come coming. And one day he and his wife came in, and they, they had, gave me a gift. And um, I opened it up, and it was, a, it was a head of Christ as a bookmark. And I think I still have the, a, a bookend, and I still have the, uh, I think I still have it. It was a beautiful thing. They only lasted in church maybe about two months, and they were gone. And I look upon it in a sense, it was sort of like the seed falling on rocky ground. It sprouted up, got started, got going, something happened, something happened in their lives, some builder, something, and they were gone. The third seed falls on the soil that's connected to the weeds, and uh, it's sort of like the weed and the tares, it kind of grows up with it. But then these weeds, you know, I play golf still. That's the one thing I could do with this thing. And uh, you should see the weeds growing <laughs> around the golf course. These, th these things are monsters because of all the rain and the soil. And they'll grow, but they'll choke out everything else unless you cut them back. And so the parable tells us that these are the, we refocus our lives, not on God, but maybe on treasures and riches or fame, or some other things, um, worries of life, and they come and they choke out our whole relationship, and our connection with God gets minimal, minimal, and minimal until it's finally gone. But then the last seed is a seed that falls on good soil. And my friends, when we're connected with God, we'll bear fruit. We're part of a, the most powerful source that there is in this world. We have a connection that will never fail it will only fail on our part, but it's there to the end. God promises not only in this life will he be with us, but he will be with us in the next life in all eternity. That's the good news for us today. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you chose to connect into our lives. And we know you're always there just with the plug in the wall, all we have to do is plug it in. Heavenly Father, we pray that each one of us would know that you are the source of all of our life, our being, our moving, our thoughts, and our power. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this thing that you've given to us in this world. We thank you that you are there and with us. And we thank you for this good news. Keep each one of us, O oh Lord, connected. Help us to push all these other things aside. 
no matter what happens, will keep plugged in to that socket of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.